this is probably the first time in history that that's happened. Uh, but uh, but uh, shortly thereafter, you will receive that email. What we're going to talk about today is uh, uh, various uh, uh, aspects of uh, Kubernetes uh, installed on OpenStack via Murano. Um, the uh, the uh, uh, Kubernetes platform with which uh, I assume that everyone attending this uh, this uh, webinar is somewhat familiar is a container orchestration framework, um, an open source container orchestration framework that runs on a variety of infrastructure solutions um, and is available uh, on uh, OpenStack and other platforms for private uh, cloud deployments um, and is available in several uh, public uh, hosted uh, iterations including Google's container engine. Um, what we're uh, going to cover today is uh, first some background on the components that go into uh, uh, our uh, presentation of Kubernetes on OpenStack, notably uh, the Murano um, uh, orchestration, uh, uh, orchestration Framework and Application Catalog. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of how Mirantis has worked with Kubernetes and Murano on OpenStack. Uh, and then we're going to drop into a long uh, and, and fairly detailed demonstration of, um, of uh, a new feature that, uh, that we think is pretty exciting, which gives you the capability of using Murano to quickly and efficiently install a uh, Kubernetes cluster on your OpenStack and, uh, and uh, control from a single pane of glass, a single CLI interface. Uh, uh, that cluster and a remote cluster on Google Container Engine and eventually on other hosted uh, Kubernetes platforms and uh, gives you control of, uh, of uh, uh, threshold-based automatic auto-scaling at the infrastructure level. Uh, so some background about Murano. The uh, uh, Murano application catalog actually is a, a driver for underlying orchestration engines um, available on OpenStack like Heat as well as other tools. Um, and it simplifies the job of uh, packaging, defining, distributing, um, cataloging, making available to end users, and ultimately configuring and deploying applications. Um, it's the um, it's the uh, underlying logic uh, behind the OpenStack Community App Catalog, um, and you know basically what it does is it lets you um, uh, it, it lets you uh, control uh, a great deal of sophisticated orchestration and uh, DevOps uh, logic to package applications uh, in uh, ways responsive to environmental conditions um, and uh, easily configurable by uh, operators and then make these uh, applications available for essentially one-click launch by uh, end users uh, within OpenStack tenants. The, uh, the, 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 the power of Murano, obviously, is a framework is that it can work with, um, with uh, really anything that comes um, uh, down the pike in terms of improved orchestration uh, tools and frameworks um, uh, and uh, industry standard um, uh, DevOps. Um, uh, tooling uh, underneath it. Uh, it's an extremely uh, uh, sophisticated and increasingly easy to use platform. Um, we have used um, Murano to install Kubernetes, um, but what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to hand the baton to Ihor, who is going to talk a little bit about uh, containers and uh, Kubernetes and uh, talk about the, the anatomy of, uh, of uh, that uh, past system and why it's important. Thank you, John. Uh, okay, so my name is Igor Dvoretsky. I am an OpenStack in operations engineer in Mirantis. And today I will describe you in brief the following things. So uh, today we'll describe you what what are containers, especially Docker containers, and what benefits do we earn uh, while using containers? Also, we'll speak about Kubernetes. What is it and how does this technology make container-based clusters deploying and managing easier? Also, I will describe you today in brief the Kubernetes multi-node architecture basics. So, a few words about containers. Container is a lightweight isolation technology that allows users to launch applications 
in an isolated environment on Linux. There are some different well-known technologies that have the main aim to run containers. Possibly the most of you have heard about Docker, as well as Rocket Project, also LXC, OpenVZ, and some other, some other technologies. But the most popular and the most fast-growing container technology is Docker. So the most of things that I'll speak today uh, will be related to Docker. Usage of the containers provide the huge benefits that uh, that should be the perfect reasons to prefer containers over their alternative technologies. First of all, uh, containers provide you the huge performance. So you can spin up and down containers much faster than the classic virtual machines and also usage of containers incurs much lower performance overhead in comparison to the classic virtual machines. When you use containers, you also use them in cost of repeatability. So repeatability, using repeatability, you can deploy containers repeatedly. You simply use a predefined image and you're allowed to run your containers repeatedly on different environments. Another container benefit is isolation. So your containers are isolated from their neighbors. They can consume each other resources. They can't influence each other directly. Uh, you can use containers, for example, for the applications in, that require the different library versions for running. You may simply isolate them from each other and run them independently. And one of the most important features, one of the most important benefits of containers is portability. So you may simply pack your code you wrote into the container, move it between the different environments, and you may run uh, run your containers on a local machine, on a, some virtual machines, run it on your private on-premises environment like OpenStack, or also on a public cloud like Amazon Web Services, Google Platform. So for you, it doesn't matter on what specific environment uh, your code is being run, and on what specific machine I am running my code. So I have, I just have to run it and I will always have possibility to migrate my applications between different environments. So running applications in the containers is the fundamentally different way of managing applications. You're going to manage your container environment as a code. Next slide, please. So uh, if you'd like to run your con Docker containers and manage them, you may run them on the pure Docker engine, manage them manually or using some easy tools. But if you're going to run your containers in the clustered infrastructure, the best opportunity for you will be running and managing containers using some specific tools that are originally developed and built for that. And one of the tools is Kubernetes. Kubernetes is an open source project that Google created last year. Its development and design are heavily influenced by internal Google uh, Borg system. So everything in Google runs in containers. Every single service, including Gmail, Google Maps, Hangouts, so on and so on, all of them are running in containers. To manage them, Google developed an infrastructure management system named Borg and originally Borg inspired Kubernetes. So Kubernetes as a complex management systems consists of their some amount of core components. Please the next slide I will describe here. Them. So first of all, Kubernetes manages containers that a single unit of runtime. Uh, there, possibly the biggest object in Kubernetes environment is a cluster. So cluster is a set of nodes used by Kubernetes to run applications. While node is a virtual or physical machine where you may see the pods with the provisioned containers. Uh, previously nodes were named as minion nodes. So the services on, on a node include Docker, Kubelet, and network proxy. Pod is the smallest unit of Kubernetes. So what the pod is, when you have a couple of containers that should work with each other very closely, they have the similar life cycle. 
they have to communicate with each other directly and they are responsible for the similar aim. This group of containers is named pod. Replication controller is a loop that drives current state towards expected state. So, for example, you define that you'd like to have, for example, five containers running at some period of time. So replication controller will take a look at the available resources and will spin up or spin down some containers to receive the desired amount of containers. Service is a group of running pods that, that run together. Services that are set of running pods that are responsible for the same aim. So for example, the load balanced backends. Also another important component of Kubernetes are labels. So label lets you have a key value pair where you may add anything you want and define some objects in your infrastructure. For example, you may differ pods with development purposes from the pods with production purposes using the labels like dev or prod. So I've described you in brief some core information regarding containers and Kubernetes and uh, before John has explained some things that are related to OpenStack and Moreno, and now uh, I will provide you with some summary regarding these things. So John, please, the, the following slide. Yeah, so usage of Docker gives you a lot of benefits of the container technology that we have already discussed. Kubernetes provides you the great possibilities to isolate your environment from the underlying infrastructure, as well as bringing extra options for container clustering and cluster management. Moreno, as an OpenStack component, provides us with opportunities to install ready-to-use packages, application catalog, uh, where these packages are located, and Moreno also provides a solid integration of our applications into OpenStack itself and OpenStack itself provides an infrastructure layer for these solutions, for the solutions that we have described above. But with Fuel, Fuel is an awesome tool for easy installation of OpenStack and also Fuel allows you to install Morena on OpenStack. Well, uh, at the current moment I'd like to invite John again, he'll tell you a few words about Morena and Kubernetes integration history. Uh, thanks, Ihor. So um, Kubernetes uh, has been uh, available uh, as uh, uh, two Murano apps since uh, OpenStack App Catalog was introduced uh, early this year. Um, the uh, the uh, and uh, those apps are <coughs> are available now. Uh, for deployment, uh, you can deploy a, a proof of concept Kubernetes cluster with a Docker uh, app uh, on board and C advisor enabled. Um, and this is a, a great solution for people who want to start very easily with uh, Kubernetes, uh, uh, exploring uh, the possibility of doing Docker-based uh, development uh, on uh, on uh, their OpenStack. Uh, but what we're going to show you today uh, extends that idea. Um, organizations obviously need uh, more than just premise clouds. They need, particularly if they're scaling out and up um, and supporting big applications, the ability to uh, to use um, uh, to use uh, public and hosted facilities where these uh, where, uh, where these are cost effective for them, and uh, the ability to burst, in principle, to these facilities as uh, as uh, uh, as uh, traffic and uh, utilization um, or application requirements demand, um, they they need these abilities. Uh, they need to be able to exploit, in particular, the portability advantages of containers. But they don't need things to be complicated. Um, Kubernetes, obviously, in principle, provides a logical um, uh, framework that allows a transparent. Uh, application portability uh, between uh, platforms because it hides the uh, uh, it hides the infrastructure layer, but there needs to be orchestration um, uh, capable of uh, capable of doing uh, in effect on the infrastructure layer what replication controllers do within the Kubernetes layer, uh, which is uh, scale up, scale down uh, in response to um, uh, actual requirements. Um, so this is what we're going to show you today. We're going to show you a system 
that Murano has developed in, in uh, collaboration with, uh, that uh, I should say Miranda has uh, worked with Biarca to develop which installs Kubernetes and OpenVPN on OpenStack, building a VPN that connects uh, a premise uh, OpenStack-based Kubernetes cluster with a Kubernetes cluster based on Google Container Engine and other, folk, uh, other hosts will be supported in the future. Uh, and that uh, automatically scales, and of course manually as well, but automatically scales Kubernetes um, minion nodes uh, in response to actual resource utilization on these clusters. It, um, it uh, uh, enables uh, both uh, a scale up in the local environment and in effect burst scaling from the premise to the hosted cloud. So with that, I'm going to hand this over. Uh, well, uh, I, I think what we're going to do is we're going to jump past this complex diagram and maybe return to it later, but I'm going to hand this over to um, uh, Bosker, uh, who uh, will lead you through the application. Thank you, John. Uh, hi, everybody. This is uh, Bhaskar Nalak Kutula. Um, as John has introduced me, uh, I work for a cloud computing company called uh, Viarka. So in partnership with uh, Mirantis, uh, we've developed or we enhanced uh, the current uh, Kubernetes application on the Murano catalog to provide a elastic, elastic scaling solution where um, depending on the uh, workloads on the cluster, uh, the scale up and scale down can be accommodated uh, within the uh, premise uh, OpenStack uh, network as well as uh, onboarding of the uh, public infrastructure. So um, what you see right now is a uh, very uh, simplified view of uh, the configuration. Uh, on the left, you have a on-premise OpenStack installation uh, with its own uh, set of nodes. Uh, the Kubernetes cluster already deployed. Um, this Kubernetes cluster is then uh, connected to a public cloud uh, infrastructure. Uh, in this case, uh, it's the GCE, the Google Cloud Engine. Uh, there are nodes running on there, and there should be an opportunity to be able to onboard those nodes and make it part of the uh, uniform Kubernetes cluster. Um, so the robust solution is Kubernetes cluster with a uh, underlying network support, which is provided by OpenVPN. OpenVPN allows you to bridge the nodes uh, and make it part of a uh, Ethernet-based uh, uh, cluster solution. Uh, and it and also provides you a secure connectivity as a as a VPN would do. Next slide, please, John. Um, so we talked about enhancement to the uh, current Kubernetes application on the Murana catalog. The enhancement is really about adding some uh, additional smarts to the current Kubernetes architecture. Uh, Kubernetes already provides a C advisor based uh, metrics on that it runs on every node that comes up in the cluster. Uh, these nodes, uh, these are REST API driven. Uh, you, can, you can invoke these uh, these specific APIs to gather metrics on the uh, CPU utilization, on memory, or the current disk or volume utilization. What we have done is a uh, simply it's a, it took a simple view of the uh, CPU metrics on each minion nodes. Um, and uh, based on it, uh, we built a solution where we could um, automatically uh, add nodes or delete nodes uh, to represent an elastic scaling infrastructure. Uh, these metrics are again driven by a policy. Uh, the policy allows you to set a max thresholds, minimum thresholds. Uh, on the metric of choice that you want to uh, build upon. The metrics of choice we've taken is uh, CPU utilization. Um, if you, if the CPU utilization is beyond the uh, upper watermark, um, obviously we want to be able to add more infrastructure to the cluster. And we want, if we can do that in an automatic fashion, and that would be a very self-monitoring uh, cluster performance. Similarly, if there is a CPU utilization that goes under the threshold, um, then we would want to be able to optimize the cluster by spinning down the um, by spinning down the node, thereby to pass on some cost savings. Uh, we could probably go to the um, 
uh, the application demonstration right now. So what's coming up here is a um, OpenStack uh, horizon view. Um, and we, in, within the horizon view, you can see that there is a Murano application catalog integrated. So we, we have taken uh, is a, the Kubernetes cluster application that's already on the catalog and we enhanced it for a auto scaling solution. And uh, Kubernetes by itself uh, on the catalog is uh, for on-premise to be able to uh, scale out and scale in with respect to external cloud, we would want to uh, build a robust network. So the, the network connectivity is provided by uh, OpenVPN. That's an application we developed and are going to be publishing to the catalog as well. Uh, what you see right now is uh, how we set up a network for the cluster to be deployed. Uh, this is a OpenVPN network that is being configured. We create an environment for OpenVPN uh, as part of uh, how we uh, deploy Murano. We define a name. We identify the network on which the environment uh, applications would be running on. And to the network, we deploy the OpenVPN bridge server. Uh, these are the next set of screens are OpenVPN specific. It takes into account um, what are the IP pools that we want uh, OpenVPN to be uh, handing out. Um, provide the particular port on which the VPN traffic would be communicating between on-premise OpenStack and the uh, GCD nodes. And provide the uh, your on-premise uh, gateway router that would lead you to the external world. In this screen, we talk about uh, OpenVPN connectivity to cloud. Um, right now, we're supporting GCC, so we think the GC option. The future, we, we have plans to enhance to other cloud providers. Provide some credentials uh, of your account on the cloud. So since we are uh, GCE based, so we provide our uh, cloud GC cloud account in the OpenVPN. The idea here is that the OpenVPN can, uh, uh, can access those compute nodes on the cloud provider provision the required certificates and provision the clients uh, such that they can be part of the uh, OpenVPN bridge network. This screen defines uh, the kind of compute node we want to uh, run the open server, uh, OpenVPN server. We pick the Ubuntu image for Murano um, and identify the network. Provide a name. In a minute or two, this will deploy on the environment. The logs tell the uh, progression of uh, how the OpenVPN server is coming up. It will, the server will come up first, then it would install the required packages from the external world, then provision the clients on the GCE nodes. When set up, it would have a floating IP and it would also be in charge of handing out the IPs from the pool that we have defined it to be controlled.
So the instances are when instances are, we uh, can log into the VPN server and check the logs and to see the provision. And also look at how the network has been configured. The tab zero interface is the one that comes up when the VPN server is installed, and you can see that it is uh, up. Tap is the interface of choice when uh, when we are configuring OpenVPN um, to be part of a network. Um, for applications that use broadcast style messages or that needs to communicate between various uh, multi nodes, it you have to be on the tap tap interface. So once the server comes up, you can check uh, the go login into your uh, nodes on your account on the uh, public uh, provider in the GC here, and you could also verify that uh, the the clients have been provisioned to be part of the OpenVPN uh, bridge. You can see they all come up on 10.50 subnets. We can ping from we can ping the server from the Google node. The server is actually running on the on-premise OpenStack. So we've uh, onboarded two nodes, and we're verifying that the um, the two nodes can communicate to the OpenVPN server on the OpenStack. And here is another check where we ping the Google nodes from the uh, VPN server. When the uh, when the server and clients communicate, that's when the deployment is complete. So once the network is up and running, the the required subnet is up and running, controlled by OpenVPN. Um, the next step is to deploy the Kubernetes application onto this network. And we follow the same process as deploying any application catalog uh, on Murano. Here we define a few metrics. Uh, threshold, as I said, this is the policy uh, that we've come up with. Uh, since we monitor the CPU metrics, we set our policy to be, okay, anything above 60%, we want to have a ability to scale up. Anything falling below 20% of CPU utilization, maybe it's a candidate we want to uh, take it out of the cluster. It, it is especially helpful when we um, and we have to spin down nodes on the public cloud because that would uh, directly pass on to uh, cost savings. And so a few more questions on the um, local tenant uh, credentials. And a flag that says we would want to be able to use a hybrid cloud strategy and we want to be able to enable a scale out, scale in using a uh, Cloud, or using GC as our cloud provider of choice. We started enhancing the Kubernetes uh, cluster app for um, auto scaling within on premise, and then we extended it to a hybrid model by bringing in OpenVPN connectivity to the Google nodes. You could have several compute nodes on your account on the public uh, provider. Um, you don't want to, maybe there's a chance of possibility that you don't want to expose all the nodes to the cluster. You want to only add some nodes and we provide the, that option over here. The nodes that you would want it to be part of the cluster. You specify the node, the IPs that has been uh, provisioned by the OpenVPN bridge. And you indicate that to the cluster and then you're on your way. So with both the applications deployed on the environment, uh, in the, in the uh, environment created on the Murano, the next step is to deploy the Kubernetes uh, cluster as well. In in few moments, you will see the configuration coming up. So the in, initial configuration that we started up was to spin up one million node or 
as our minimum configuration for the demo purpose. Uh, you could obviously spin as many minimum uh, configuration you want for your application based on your application requirements. So in this demo, we spin up one as a minimum uh, as a minimum uh, node, a minion node, and the maximum we want to be on the on premise is two. So anything, anytime there is an application requirement uh, for uh, more than two nodes on the cluster, um, if the private uh, node capacity is uh, maximized, we would look to go, the autoscaler will look to go to the public nodes. Here we see that the um, cluster has been deployed, a C advisor is running on all the nodes. Uh, that's giving out the statistics or metrics for the resources of choice. So C advisor is deployed on all the uh, nodes right now on the cluster. Um, our autoscaler service uh, pulls the C advisor metrics to monitor the health of the cluster. In, in this demo, we monitor the CPU workloads. So, cube one is the master. Master is more the the autoscaler service runs on the monitor on the master. It monitors the uh, metrics from every other node in the cluster. If we open the log, you uh, could see the timestamp and look at the CPU utilization. Since we said that our initial configuration would be uh, one minion node uh, for the demo purpose, uh, we could see that uh, the uh, the one minion node that's in, in the cluster is operating at a very low uh, CPU thresholds. Basically, uh, we haven't yet uh, added any workloads to this CPU in the cluster. At some point, when we add workloads uh, onto the CPU, the CPU utilization will go up. And when we drive it up beyond the max threshold, we should be able to see the autoscaler looking to scale up and add more nodes to its uh, infrastructure. As I mentioned before, it will try to add uh, interest, uh, a node on the, on the local infrastructure, on the private infrastructure first, until it's maximized. The metrics monitoring service also uh, takes into account hysteresis. So until it, uh, until it thinks that the system is at a steady state, uh, the triggers for scale up and scale down does not come through. This is to protect the cluster from uh, trashing where um, transient uh, spikes on the CPU uh, loads on the upside or the downside does not end up uh, spinning more nodes or spinning down nodes. So as we start scaling up the workloads on the nodes, we should, we should see the scalar scaling up on the private. So the scalar is looking for a steady state to be achieved. As so, the workloads are being uh, added on the on another window. 
and this window is uh, essentially dumping the uh, metrics as of now. So as the nodes have workloads have increased, we can see the CPU shooting up to uh, its max uh, utilization as uh, seen by the C advisor. So you added, um, uh, you used I.O. to add two workloads, right, to this in order to achieve 100% utilization? Correct, John. So in order to increase it beyond the max threshold. When the max threshold is reached, we see that the scaling up has been triggered on the open stack. And on the uh, horizon dashboard, we can see that the deployment is uh, taking place. So the Murano will add a node here, um, and the, uh, the service will uh, be spun up. The required services on the node will be spun up, the Kubernetes services, the kubelets, the kube proxies, the ETCD service. Now we can see a node uh, come up. Now it would be probably cube 3. In a minute or two, the, the scale up completes, and we could see the C advisor being deployed on the new node, and that starts to uh, send out the CPU usage for that node as well. So now the cluster is or consists of uh, two mini nodes, all scaled out. So the new addition has been scaled up automatically. You could see that the first node uh, that we where we added the CPU workload continues to be at a, operating at a high workload while the uh, other node that has just come up is it's still at a very low CPU utilization. The idea behind is the application will take advantage and rebalance the workloads to take advantage of the new nodes. Here's a topology diagram from the horizon view. On one hand, it shows the open VPN network. The other hand is the Kubernetes uh, topology. We can see all the nodes in the in the cluster here, including the new node Q3 that has just been uh, scaled up. A view of all the instances uh, so far in the cluster. Taking a look at how we're doing on the metrics part, how this, uh, how the uh, CPU workloads are currently performing on the two nodes in the cluster. We, we haven't added any new workloads on the new node. And so this cluster remains um, pretty much at a steady state here until we start adding new workloads on the uh, new node that has spun up. So we also look at the uh, cube control CLI uh, to take a look at what Kubernetes control CLI thinks about the cluster. You can see that the get nodes will tell us that two nodes have been added right now operating in the cluster. So we want to maximize on the on-premise on, the on -premise open stack. 
and we define in our policy that the maximum on the on-premise OpenStack right now would be about two nodes. So the cluster is right now operating theoretically at the uh, maxed, maxed out node scheme. So any new workloads uh, pushing the CPU utilization higher than uh, the max threshold should scale out to the public nodes. As we can see, we are uh, on another window, we are increasing the workloads on the CPU. So we, uh, the workloads are simply uh, keeping a C, um, increasing the IO, uh, IO levels on the CPU to uh, raise its utilization to beyond the max. So it, it has taken a snapshot of it and thinks that the uh, nodes are operating at uh, beyond the max uh, limits on both the nodes and triggering a scale up. Because the OpenStack has maximized, we scale up the GCE. Now we go on to the GC node shell, node console, um, add the workloads to increase the GC uh, utilization. If you remember in our configuration, we added two GC nodes to the cluster. or we indicated our uh, need to onboard to two GC nodes if required. So 10.50.0.40 is the CPU instance one, or is the GC instance one. And as we increase the load, it's gone up to 100. So we have three nodes in the cluster, two OpenStack and one GC node. And with uh, two nodes operating at a very high threshold, it calls for an addition of a new node to the infrastructure. We have a room to grow uh, on the GCE by one more node. And let us see if that gets triggered. as we scaled up, scaling up of GC is also taking place. On the horizon dashboard, as we indicated to the Kubernetes master to uh, onboard the new nodes, the redeployment takes place. New nodes are added or deleted using the etcd service. etcd manages the discovery processes of uh, new nodes that have come into the cluster or nodes that leave the cluster. On the uh, cube CTL, we can see that we have labeled uh, the GC nodes to be of type GC, and we also uh, look at the creation type. Uh, we can see that they have been auto scaled to. It's important for the application to keep track of the nodes that have been scaled up by the uh, scaler, and those that might be scaled up uh, manually. So we, we find the kube cluster here is a hybrid uh, cloud with two nodes on the GC and the two nodes on OpenStack.
the CPU utilizations is all at maxed out right now across across the node, across the whole cluster, based on our policy. So we've pretty much seen how the scale-ups have uh, taken us from uh, scaling up on the private infrastructure all the way on to public uh, infrastructure, all seamlessly. The pods or the pods running on the cube, cube cluster will have uh, absolutely no idea where they are um, they are located. They'll all be uh, in one unified Kubernetes cluster. So all the scale up has been have been done. Uh, maybe it's time to look at the scale down function. As we remove the loads on various nodes, uh, we want to see that the the nodes are released, are taken out of the cluster and released back to the cloud or whichever cloud they belong to. As I had mentioned earlier, um, the, the scaler has a built-in hysteresis. So a quick drop or a quick spike up or spike down of a CPU loads does not necessarily trigger an up or down operation. Um, it has to deter, determine a state. So we remove loads and we see the scale down operation getting triggered and a Kubernetes cluster rebalancing taking place. Similarly, we would uh, scale down the other nodes. So you get the idea based on uh, how the scale up and scale down works in this overall scheme of things. we've seen how the autoscaler uh, up-down function works. Uh, in addition, we also have a very tight integration. The Murano provides us the benefits of extending uh, uh, or hooks and extending the uh, ability to onboard uh, external public cloud. And in this case, we see an example of how add GC node or delete GC nodes have been integrated within the Murano APIs. We see what we're seeing right now is uh, if we determine that we need an, uh, a node addition on demand, uh, right now we have added that feature where we can say add a GC node and that'll show up in the cluster as well. There could be a transient need uh, depending upon the application workload where we would just want to spin up a node as an admin, uh, distribute the workload for a certain time and determine that we're done and want to delete the node. That, that level of manual control is also available. You can see that a new a GC node was added. After scaling down all the way to the minimum levels, we triggered a manual addition, and that has shown up on the Kubernetes cluster. And we can spin down that node on demand as 
Sure. That in a nutshell is the uh, entire process of auto scale up with a support for manual scaling up, scaling down as well. Thank you for uh, this uh, presentation of the demo. That concludes the demo, and we can move on to the Q and A part. Thank you very much, Bhaskar. Uh, I should explain to people that we've been looking at this demo and working with it for several days. And uh, normally, um, we would do such a thing live. Uh, we have all seen it done live many, many times. But we made the decision to go to video because there are so many windows to manage uh, in the course of uh, running this demo uh, that uh, that it be it, you know it sort of exceeds the capacity of mortal engineers to uh, to to do it gracefully. So. Um, uh, we have some questions from the audience, and we have very limited time. Uh, we will uh, uh, get to all questions uh, in a blog post uh, in the next couple of days, and you'll get an email um, pointing you towards that blog post so that uh, if your question is not uh, answered, uh, please look for it there. Um, the first question uh, is, uh, uh, and, and I guess I'll take this one, is why we're not demonstrating uh, hybrid scale out with uh, Kubernetes and Murano on uh, Mirandus OpenStack 7. Um, uh, this, uh, to be clear, this uh, demonstration that we've shown you is on um, is on uh, Liberty uh, Trunk, um, and uh, and uh, was developed there because there are uh, Neutron features uh, in uh, implemented in uh, Liberty that it requires. Uh, we will um, uh, shortly be backporting those changes to uh, the update to Miranda's OpenStack, and so this uh, uh, feature, uh, this uh, this uh, application will work um, handily. Uh, sometime uh, or early in the first quarter of uh, next year. Um, the, um, uh, the, the next question I guess I will hand to, uh, to, to Bosker. Um, uh, are there alternative VPN services that could be used uh, with this application? Uh, yes, there are alternatives uh, to OpenVPN. Uh, GC itself, uh, the Google Cloud Engine also provides their own Native VPN service. Uh, those services uh, come at a cost, so one has to pay uh, for uh, enabling that service. Uh, Open VPN is uh, we went with an Open VPN because it was lightweight, and we wanted to try uh, other alternatives to uh, existing VPN services as well. Um, uh, another. Uh higher level question, uh, which I'll address to Ihor. Uh, what are the benefits of using Kubernetes? Uh, why can't we set up a similar environment using pure Docker? Well, regarding this question, so you may use Docker. You may use pure Docker, but you also should understand if you'll set up a really clustered uh, high level environment with their wide distribution on the different locations. For example, on the uh, huge amount of different nodes, you have to manage that environment. And you may use some alternative solutions or self-made solutions like simple scripts for managing them. Or you may use a ready-to-use solution that has been developed by Google and has been also co-developed by the huge amount of companies that are also working in this sphere. So you may use Kubernetes for that, and that is really ready-to-use solution for solving similar things. Um, uh, another one for uh, for for Bosker. Um, you're using um, C Advisor uh, as a mechanism for capturing the metrics that this application uh, works on. Are there other metrics tools that can be uh, inserted there? Yes, um, there are other metrics tools available. Uh, C Advisor was a natural choice because it came with the Kubernetes deployment. It runs on all the nodes, and you can uh, get a granular look at uh, each node's uh, performance uh, metrics. There are other nodes such as Heapster uh, for the entire cluster. Uh, it is also feasible to integrate our service with uh, any metrics tool. Uh, Heapster is one, there's also a Sysdig. Uh, 
right now I think we went with the CE advisor, but there is no limitation to which other uh, network monitoring or metrics monitoring tool you can plug in our service. Um, uh, another question um, for for whoever wants to take it. Um, uh, what uh, what is the configuration on Kubernetes and Google Cloud Engine to see these minion nodes as as one cluster? Is it account based? I'm I, I'm I'm not experienced enough with GCE uh, to to really even understand the question. Who wants to take that one? I can go. Or you want to go? So um, I may describe in brief. Uh, how have we solved this question? So, first of all, you should understand that either GCE or OpenStack or possibly AWS or Rackspace or another cloud environments in the future that we may implement. So, either GCE and uh, OpenStack are simply infrastructure layers for our solutions. So, Kubernetes in being based on above of these solutions. So, we also, we have possibility to connect our private cloud with OpenStack on it, with a public cloud where we use Google Cloud Engine using OpenVPN. We have the single network and we have possibility to deploy our nodes of Kubernetes cluster on both environments. So we should understand that using some cloud provider will be our infrastructure solution. But Kubernetes, but for Kubernetes, it doesn't matter what solution do you use. It simply runs. Uh, and with that, uh, I believe that we are obliged to close uh, this uh, the live portion of this webinar. Uh, as I mentioned, an email will be sent to attendees that will give you access to um, a reviewable uh, version of the slides and uh, an extended version of the uh, the video uh, with uh, with uh, uh, better uh, uh, more 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 coherent subtitling and other uh, pretty video effects to amuse you. Um, thank you very much uh, to my uh, co-presenters Bhaskar and Igor, uh, and uh, look forward to uh, to seeing where this goes. Uh, and uh, in uh, using it on uh, Meritus OpenStack 7.1 in the near future. Thanks, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you, John. Thank you, Igor. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, attendees. Goodbye.